Sabir Aline. Seasons are changing. It's getting a little cooler at night, so it's time to pull out those sweaters. Matter of fact, I pulled out my scarf this week. Uh, my staff laughed at me. I told them, I said, okay, well, y'all be sick tomorrow, and I'll still be coming in here well. Uh, and many of my staff are sick. They're sick on a regular basis because they just keep passing whatever it is around. Uh, like they're playing ping pong or something. They pass it back and forth and shake each other's hands, touch handles, doorknobs, all those kind of things. And uh, I told them, I said, it's not the weather for being cute. Being cute's long over. And what I mean by being cute, you go outside, you keep going out there with those little skimpy jackets, skimpy sweaters, no hats. Uh, walking around on a cold wood floor or marble floors or whatever kind of floor you're walking on. If it's not carpeted, your feet are not protected and your heat gets lost to your head, the top of your head and your feet. So if you put a hat on your head and you put socks on your feet, uh, the rest of you will pretty much stay warm. You'll lose some heat from your hands but um, the top of your head and your feet are pretty much key to staying warm. But you also want to keep that air from going down the back of your neck because that's another thing that happens as well. Uh, that uh, the uh, air winds up down your back and you wind up getting a stiffness in your back and then uh, your throat and all that all up in here starts getting cold. So if you keep this covered, something on your head and your feet, you do pretty good. Um, so today's show is going to be focusing on trauma. I've been talking about traumatic things uh, uh, for the last uh, month or so. Anytime you enter into a relationship, you're bringing your stuff. Uh, uh, the other person has their stuff. So there's a lot of stuff between the two of you, and somewhere not along the line, you have to sort through that stuff uh, and begin to stabilize uh, in the relationship. What often happens is, though, uh, is that uh, stabilization uh, comes at a cost. And it comes, for some, at a big cost, because you get to the point where you realize that the things that are taking place don't belong to the other person, they in fact belong to you, and then you have to start doing some work. And the work you begin to do often causes you to regress to certain periods of your life. And those periods uh, of your life uh, often entail painful ones as well as the good ones. Um, it's always easy to go to the good ones, but uh, you have to face the difficult ones as well because when you don't face the difficult ones the difficult ones are the ones that keep you in the same condition over and over again and you find yourself repeating the same the, the same scenarios in each of your relationships and one of the things that I learned that no matter what what it is that you do in your uh, so-called re uh, intimate relationship with your your partner uh, those behaviors trickle down into other relationships as well. So nothing really changes. There, there's, you know, uh, varied stages of love, varied levels of love, different types of love that uh, gets expressed between different people. But whatever way you form relationships, the way you maintain relationships, no matter who it's with, it will be the same across the board. And some people want to believe that they change. They, they're somebody different. Uh, in each one of the relationships. No, you have a certain set of boundaries. There are boundaries that exist in every relationship. 
And what you do is you establish those boundaries based on the level of that relationship. So if you are in a relationship with your wife, your husband, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, there's a different boundary that's established uh, as opposed to the one with the local grocer who you may see when you go shopping every two weeks or how often you go shopping. Um, so, but you're the same way across the board in how you deal with people. And one of the things that often happens is when events happen in our lives, uh, we begin to build on uh, those uh, events. Uh, and those events often stand in the way of uh, how we're going to uh, engage that other person. Right? Hold on two seconds. I need to move this other camera over because I'm actually looking at two cameras. The one here in front of you on Facebook and I have another one. Hold the thought. That's one of the benefits of being live. You get run into these kind of things sometimes. But you just keep it moving. You keep talking to people. Let people know what's going on like anything else. And it gets better. All right. Here we go. So. Uh, yeah, because what, what I do is I actually, I, I do the live uh, Facebook uh, show, then I also do, I do the one on uh, the camera, because I film it on the camera, and then I upload it into YouTube. So uh, the one that you're seeing on the live version is not of good quality, even though you can access it again uh, on Facebook. Uh, the one that you'll get on YouTube uh, is actually an edited version, uh, which means it has run through um, a process, uh, be it an MP4, uh, WMV, whatever the format is, it goes through a whole nother process, therefore you have a clearer uh, video, but you also have something that you can replay at your desk. Uh, you can replay this afternoon when the children come over and you want to have some conversation with them about certain matters. or uh, it's it's good listening and it creates good dialogue between you and your partner about particular subject matters that um, are discussed uh, on this show. So, um, in getting back to the trauma, one of the things that I want, I want to begin with is looking at uh, what is referred to as a broken heart syndrome. And a lot of people will laugh at that and say, well, that doesn't make sense, it's not for real, but in the same breath, they're sitting there all broken up inside. They're having chest pains. They're having tightness in their, in their chest. They're um, having some elevated stress, some elevated anxiety, and don't wonder why. Well, Psychology Today actually has an article that speaks specifically to uh, the broken heart syndrome. It's real and it's rough. Healing the Heartache of Love. And this article uh, is by Deborah Serrani, uh, a, a psychologist, um, and is talking about healing the heartache of love. And this was posted February 13th of 2012. And uh, it's real, folks. When we break up and when we lose uh, relationships and, and, you know, in whatever capacity they are, whether a person died, whether a person left you, whether you left them, whether that person is away, <coughs> excuse me, um, your heart feels it if you really cared about the person. And I say if you really cared about the person because sometimes we're in situations with people, we care, uh, but then it's not one of those heartfelt caring. It's a matter of we're complacent, we're familiar with one another, so we're just together. You know, we do some things together, and that's about the extent of it. Um, and there's, there's a level of loss and grief that's experienced even in those kind of relationships. But when you talk about a broken heart, usually there's an attachment to that person, that person, a very significant attachment to that person. So here it's talking about facts about broken heart syndrome. The first bulleted item it has there is profound emotional sadness doesn't just weigh heavy on your mind, it significantly impacts your body. 
So when you start looking at the profound emotional sadness, right, and what it has done to your mind, let's look at that for a minute. Because what it does to the mind is it, it gives you a sense of distrust of others. It creates a distrust of others. It has you feeling like uh, whatever it was that that other individual did or failed to do is going to potentially be existent in a coming relationship. So anybody who enters into any kind of uh, engagement with you, uh, attempt to encounter you in an effort to have dialogue, to maybe pursue you because they find you to be of interest. Well, you have some doubts there because the person you were with uh, pretty much displayed the same things. You were together for a period of time, you shared some things together, not just monetary, materialistic things, but you shared some, some of your most innermost thoughts with that person. You developed a, an intimate relationship with that person to the capacity that there was trust. You shared a lot of things. And somewhere along the line, for whatever reason, the relationship stopped working. And it stopped working before an actual event. It stopped working before an actual event. Because what we often talk about um, in, in counseling is there's an activating event. But it's not the activating event that causes the, uh, the feelings that brings about the consequences, right? It's the belief about the event. And when you look at the belief about the event, then you'll see why you're in the position you are, as far as in this case, distrust. So here you meet someone. And nice dialogue, probably a nice person. But that's as far as you're going to take it. Because your belief right now is that this person too will do the same as the other person has done. Because the other person, they, they were great. You, you just don't know where things went wrong. Everything was going great. Somewhere along the line, something changed. Either you didn't notice the change in the other person. You didn't notice the change within yourself. There were some things that were overlooked. Or maybe there were some things that you turned a blind eye to in hopes that they were going to go away. Or maybe there were some things that you thought you were going to be able to control and you couldn't control them. And as a result of that, of that happening, you lost control. And there, as such, went the individual too. But here you have the same situation again. Another nice person. Good dialogue. Good company. But the distrust is something you can't get past. And you're not going to try to get past it in many cases because now you're guarded. Now you're guarded. So we're just talking about the impact in your mind, the sadness, the profound sadness in the mind. In the mind, all those things that you're telling yourself, that person sitting in front of you, you might be out eating dinner and they order a similar item off of the menu. You're at a different restaurant, not even in the same restaurant, not even in the same city, but that person just ordered something off of the menu that reminds you of what your former person would order. And that's called a trigger. So they ordered a, a medium cooked steak and they wanted some ajou to accompany it when they brought it to the table. Now, not many people order ajou with their steak. They'll order some kind of steak sauce or something of that nature. So here this person orders that. And you look at that person like, is this a reincarnated version? What's happening? Am I going to do this all over again? And automatically your defenses kick in. So all your defenses, all your defenses are present right now and you don't even realize it. This person is just laughing and joking and smiling and you're just sitting there and you have it on your face that you're having a good time. But your mind is so clouded. Your thinking is so distorted because the only thing you can think of now is this other person. And you don't have to be thinking about the person in terms of, you know, what happened. 
the event that caused the two of you to separate. But right now, you're really just thinking about, you're sitting here, it's like almost a deja vu situation. But that's what trauma is. Trauma will cause you to relive a circumstance right before your very eyes. But you don't even see it. It's like experiencing something with your, your eyes wide shut of a sort. This person is sitting in front of you. It's not the same person. But when they ordered that menu item, it triggered something within you. And you're not even there anymore at the table. You're physically sitting there, but you're not even there anymore. Because now this, your, your, your paranoia kicks in. So we've gone through, from talking about the distrust, now we're talking about paranoia. Because now you, you're trying to understand what the heck is going on. Right? What is, what is this dude really working with? How, how did he know to order that steak? Is this somebody that my ex knows? Is this an old friend of theirs? Do they have a conversation? Do they know me? And they just acting like they don't know me? What, what's really happening here? What's going on here? And then you start asking them questions out of left field that have nothing to do with what it is you're sitting down discussing. And you start pursuing a line of questioning of this new person. But you're actually basing your questioning off of the old person. Unbeknownst to the person you're sitting in front of. Oh yeah, this gets real confusing. It gets real confusing. Because when you start looking at trauma, and we're going to talk more about trauma today, you're really going to see the effects of trauma and how you have been traumatized and don't even realize it. So now we're still, we're still talking about the trauma, the, the, the profound emotional sadness in the mind, right? And when we talk about something that weighs heavy on the mind, you have to also look at the fact that the, the depression that kicks in, right? The depression kicks in because of what you're telling yourself about the loss. And now you have to do all of these things alone without that person. You sit there, you want to call that person, you want to have some conversation with that person. Um, and a lot of times when the relationship has ended, depending on how far uh, alone you are, you want to make that phone call to that person because you want to find out what went wrong. But you don't really want to find out what went wrong. You really want that person back. But you want them to give you a viable explanation for what happened. So you spend countless hours thinking, reliving over and over again. Y'all are together for five years and you're, you'll sit down and try to relive five years so you can try to backtrack and see where things started going wrong. Because that's going, that, that's going to be important because you need to nail it down. Because you know that whatever I event happens is not the event that actually broke, uh, broke the, the camel's back of a sort. But right now that's what's being used. But as I talked about in previous shows, there, there were signs along the way. Like a lot of things happened on the way to grandmother's house. You know the story about Little Red Riding Hood, right? So there was a wolf along the way in that path that was kind of like incognito, but showing up, you know, showing up, showing up in different forms, but the wolf was on that path, right? So the same thing happens in, in relationships. When relationships get to the point of failing, there were things that showed up and they're not necessarily things about the other person, but it's also things that show up about you and your ability or lack thereof to deal with certain things, to confront certain things within yourself. See, one of the challenges in a relationship is that oftentimes we focus so much on the other person that we lose focus of our own flawed self. Our own flawed self. And we want to challenge and we want to correct the flaws of the other person when we're not even addressing our own. 
and then at the end of the day we find ourselves in the fetal position by ourselves once again as such in this case and a lot of times it had nothing to do with the other person it had everything to do with you when people don't deal with their unresolved right it just loads up in the mind not in the brain in the mind and this is what trauma is it's things that you keep telling yourself about yourself about the circumstance about your past about your present and future you have this catastrophic perception you have this self-destructive uh, uh, characteristic uh, 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 and, and what happens is over time it eats you alive it eats you alive and this is what's happening when you when you get your heart broken because it's not the first time the, 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 the most significant relationship that we have early on is with our parents and we have expectations of our parents and we can have the best parents in the world they can buy us everything they can take us everywhere right but as we come into to self and we get to a certain age there's an expectation that we begin to have of the parents no I'm not telling you that we love them less but we trust them and when we trust them and we want to give them certain things about us right and we can't give them those things about us because we know their judgment of those things then it causes us to change how we feel about the relationship now we don't stop loving them but I should be able to tell my mother and my father anything that's from a perspective of a child right and when I say child I'm not just talking about some, uh, 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 zero to two uh, or five to twelve I'm talking about thirty to sixty you're still that parent's child so you should be able to have that conversation when you can't have that conversation right whether it's fact or something you self-created it still puts a barrier between you and that healthy relationship so everything about a relationship between the child and the parent right is prevalent today it's prevalent today in all other relationships because when there's a sign that you can't do this then you blame the other person or you make that other person you know feel uh, some level of guilt because of an inability that you have but sometimes we place too much significance on things and that's another aspect of what you have to look at because you place too much emphasis on certain things because you want things to be a certain way in order for you to be comfortable in order for you to be happy but when are you ever comfortable? When are you ever happy? Because that's the first question that has to be answered. And I talked about this in, in the last show, I believe it was, when I, I told you write a list. Write a list of 10 things that you can do for yourself. For yourself. Can you go out to eat dinner by yourself? Right? Can you go to the theater by, you, by yourself? Right? Are you okay with going to a family gathering by yourself? Are you okay with going to a party where it's not a family gathering by yourself? What are, what are the things that are important to you that you ha have as part of your, your daily regimen of life? Be it, you know, uh, getting up in the morning and having breakfast, having dinner at night, whatever it is. Write that list for yourself. Now anybody you bring into your life should be able to complement that list they may be able to bring some extra things to the list but those ten things are the foundation of your daily living right that means in order for you to have a healthy life independent of anybody else you need to be able to look at those ten things first and say these things are the most meaningful to my life these things are going to keep me alive and balanced without someone and oftentimes people fail to make that list so when you make that list and then you want somebody else to bring those things on your list to fruition that's where you fail but you fail but you want to make the other person feel like they failed 
because it's easier because you've done the work on those things but people don't write lists on boards or on a piece of paper anymore people put them in their minds and the problem with you putting something in your mind and trying to recall what you put there is because when somebody comes into your life you automatically draw them into your list unbeknownst to them right and then you hold them accountable for making those things possible that's where the trauma comes in because now you have an expectation of somebody else when they don't do it you come down on yourself you come down on them it becomes depressing because it didn't happen right you didn't take the time to say well I'm gonna go to the mall by myself because you won't go because that person is there the expectation is well you're not doing anything else why can't you go I want to be with you we should be together but the person doesn't go they want they just want to chill they want to do something else now the divide begins to happen right because now you begin to go up into the terror dome up here into the terror dome and you begin to create things about that person he doesn't love me anymore he used to always want to go to the mall with me you're not looking at the fact that it was a long work week for him and that he just wanted to chill it's like he said but you create something else about the situation right but wh where's your relevance there to that person is it relevant to the current situation or is this a past unresolved that continues to linger and resurface and resurface right and once again we, we haven't we're still talking about the profound sadness in the mind of a person who has a broken heart because it's real the article speaks to it if you run broken heart there's actually some who even call it a broken heart syndrome I'm not gonna go that far as to say all of that because I can go into the DSM-4 DSM-5 and I can tell you you know that there's a, a there, there's a, a, a condition there how to define the condition is based on how long it's been there right was it is, is how, how is it something that uh, 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 actually happen or did you interpret something in a particular manner based on your condition because sometimes things just trigger something within us and we get stuck all over again then there's sometimes there are things that happen that we've never experienced before and the the shock or the uh, uh, surprise or the uh, um, uh, well, I guess shock and surprise is uh, most significant, but then there's also times when you have a different expectation, such as the case with the relationship. You expected that person to be there for life. You expected that that person was going to be true to you. You expected that she'll never leave. He'll never leave. Or that you would never leave. So when you look at what happens to a person in the mind, the sadness, you know, in the mind that's caused by the, the loss of that relationship, right? We know that there are, there are cousins of those uh, 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 um, behaviors as well, such as anger. So now you're angry at, at everybody because of where you're at so all of your interactions are grounded in anger and when I say anger I'm not talking about the raw rage where you're walking around breaking up stuff and you're just slamming stuff around and you got the scowl on your face not nobody can say anything to you that's really positive or anything that you're going to absorb as being uh, encouraging uplifting none of it nothing so this wonderful dinner date that you're on right now and this person just ordered something that's much much like what the other person ordered and you look at that as being catastrophic it's all it's all downhill from there uh, and then it's, it's, it's a bad date but the other person being gracious as they are completes the date 
And so listen, I don't, you know, I, and me, I tell you, listen, you, you good? Because you seem a little agitated. Is it something that I'm wearing? And is it, is it me? What? And I'll ask the question because I'm not one who really cares or concerns himself with the fact that um, you, you might not like my line of questioning and decide that you want to roll because that'd be a good thing for me because maybe you should roll. Uh, if this is if this is not something uh, that you want to do, don't waste my time. I can finish up dinner by myself and I'll pay the check. You have a good evening. You can get a little doggy bag if you like. I mean, that's just who I am. Because I'm not going to sit there and let, let you attack me, beat up on me, because you just want in the spaces. Because I'm going to enjoy my food. And the best way for me to enjoy my food is you not being at this table, if that's what you, you're bringing to the table. But we do that. And we do that even in existing relationships and don't realize that we're doing it. We have that same level of anger because we're mad at the other person for that other relationship not working. Listen, relationships end all the time, right? And people tell themselves that they move on. But what does that mean when you say you moved on? Right? Because there's three parts to getting out of a relationship. There's a physical, there's the spiritual, and then there's the mental. You don't just leave and that's the end of the story. You don't. It, it doesn't happen that way. We may separate. You may move out. I may move out. That's the physical aspect of departing the ways. So in that is an adjustment. They're not there anymore when you come in from work. They're not sitting on the sofa anymore. They're not sitting at the computer. They're not in the kitchen cooking. They're not in the bed, napping, chilling, showering, whatever it is, they're not there anymore. They're physically absent, out of sight, not out of mind, right? Not out of mind. They're just not there. You still continue to look for them. As such is the case when somebody dies, you can see someone buried, but you still continue to look for them. It's a natural thing that the human being does. It's a natural thing that the human being does, right? Uh, I lost uh, my best friend uh, weeks before my, my first, first marriage, my, my first wedding, weeks, right? I knew he passed, right? I knew he passed, right? But at, even after his funeral, I was still thinking that I would see him. I would see a bus drive by and say, look like... It's a natural thing to do. That's part of the grieving process. That's part of the grieving process. The first thing that comes with, with, with grief in any capacity is anger. It's anger. And when you transition from the anger to the sadness, it's only determined by the person. Can't nobody else determine that. Some stay in the stage of anger for a long time. Because they're angry because the person left me. They're angry because the person, you know, should have told me that they were sick and I, maybe I could have helped them. They're angry because the person is just not there. They can't talk to that person anymore. They, they relied upon that person in so many different capacities and that person is no longer there. Well, it's the same way with a broken heart. It's the same way. Just because you move to the next person doesn't mean that the other person does not still reside within you because there's still that that emotional that the mental the spiritual connection to that person no matter how bad it, it, it the relationship may have ended it was still right a healthy relationship at some point whether it was actually healthy or perceived happiness doesn't matter there was a period in the relationship where you, you enjoyed one another. You enjoyed one another. Now, what changed, when it changed, is not important to even make the determination at this point. What is important to understand is that no matter what, you still allow that person to reside within you. Right? And until you purge yourself of the thoughts about that person, right, the other parts of you can't begin to heal. Nobody can determine what part heals first. But I can tell you this, that any behavioral change that's going to be possible has to begin with the thinking.
has to begin with the thinking. Right? You have to begin to think differently about the circumstance. You have to begin to think differently about the other person, about yourself. You have to begin to think differently about those things before you can begin to speak them into existence because you actually do speak things into existence, right? The same way you can speak things away. It's what you tell yourself about that situation. If you want to ride on the fact of, of how wrong this person was for what they did or did not do, you can do that. That doesn't allow you to take ownership for your role. If any. Because sometimes we don't have a role in situations. Sometimes people just are who they are and they just can, they have the right to be who they are and they have the right to walk away from a situation they don't find to be pleasing to them. Period. But yes, it, it would be nice if they had had a discussion, right? It would have been nice if they had had, you know, uh, you know, taken the time to write it down and maybe, you know, uh, visit that area of displeasure and maybe bring some resolve to it. But when you have an, an unrealistic expectation that somebody's going to stop doing something or start doing something because that's what you want them to do, well, that's where you failed in the beginning. You don't have any control over another person. You have no power over another person, right? Even in marriage, there is an obligation, you know, of submission that has to be uh, in place. That doesn't mean that the other person controls you. That doesn't mean that the other person has power over you, right? But as a leader of my home, as a leader of my marriage, as, you know, the imam of my home, right? I have a responsibility, right? And you have to yield as my wife to that responsibility. And if you're not willing to yield to that, then that's part of the problem, right? And that's what happens in relationships, that there's a yielding that fails to take place because it's something that's not been discussed. And my wife and I, my wife and I have this discussion often and I, I say to her how, you know, um, that I find that uh, many black women have a problem yielding and submitting to their husbands, hence the reason why there are so many complications in marriage and also in relationships that never come to fruition to marry. So most of this stuff has more to do with the individual and how they interpret things, how they internalize things that have taken place in the course of their lives. And we're still talking about the profound emotional sadness upon the mind after a person has had their heart broken, right? The physical stuff is really heavy because you, you really don't recognize it. One day you just look up in the mirror and you look, at your, you look in your face and you see how your face has changed so much. How this circumstance has aged you. I mean literally aged you. I was talking to uh, a group of guys uh, yesterday, uh, Friday. We, had a, we have a, a monthly function with our guys and we make you know, a note of their accomplishments for the month. And one of the things that I was telling them was that, you know, I'm 56 years old. And I, as I look around the room, you know, um, I know that the ages of, of these, these men vary from 20 on up. And I was saying for those of you, I got like 15, 10, 30, 20 years on, y'all look older than me. Or y'all look the age that I perceived in my mind that someone at 56 should look like. And they're like 20s and 30s and 40 years old. And I told them, what, what you're doing is you're allowing shame, guilt, embarrassment, remorse, resentment, anger, hate, and so on and so on. You're allowing them things to consume you inside. And it ages you. It ages you. It really does. It starts causing a deterioration within the spirit. Right? 
And what, what people don't realize is, especially when you start talking about the stomach, and this is coming from a person who has, who has ulcers, right? Now I haven't had, I can always tell when I'm really at a high level of stress because I start feeling that little, little tinge in my stomach, right? But my, my uh, ulcers were like near perforation. Right, like the lining of my stomach was very close to perforation many years ago, over 20 something years ago. And uh, thankfully the, the doctor who saw me sitting in, in the waiting room admitted me while I was in the waiting room. I was just in the waiting room for my first visit. And this was at Graduate Hospital in South Philadelphia, right? I was sitting there because I went to see a gastroenterologist because I, I had many years of having problems with my stomach. Well, a lot of it had to do, had more to do with the lifestyle that I was living, right? The stress, high stress lifestyle I was living. And I was drinking alcohol at the time, and I was drinking more alcohol to take away the pain, not realizing I was causing more suffering upon that area. But anyway, so when he, he had me admitted, and by the time I got back there, he said, yeah, I just need you to go ahead and put the hookup on because I already got your room set up for you because I'm going to admit you. Like the whole part, up, upper part of my, my uh, uh, intestine, my stomach, it was just swelled. It was swollen. And it, the swelling would never go down. And it was always this burning sensation. And I would drink more because I wanted to make the, the, it, it stop. It was hurting. And uh, I found that I had ulcers. And I had uh, two of them. One was right at the top of, of the, the intestine. Right, as soon as you know anything goes down, it's right there. So everything I ate brushed across it, right, which was causing more friction. And then I had one a little further down. So uh, you know they got me in there, and uh, they they looked in there, did an endoscopy, and they saw. And one was about the size of my thumbnail, and one was probably about the size of my my forefinger uh, nail. But I looked at them, and they you know they gave me treatments. So I was going back and forth to the hospital for a while. But one of the things I learned through that process was that this was more of, of, of related to stress. The, the acids in your stomach, because I was taking Tagamet, Zantec, and all these things, and it really had more to do with stress than anything else. So when people tell you it's hot sauce, it's this and it's that, ulcers typically begin as a result of stress. And some people continue to take Maalox and, and all that other kind of stuff, drinking it to make their stomach feel better, and they're not making any changes with their lifestyles. Such is the case with a broken heart. So we've gone from the mind to the physical impact, right, that a broken heart will have. And you must also understand that these things don't just go away because you get into a new relationship. Sometimes they carry on for years. I mean, prevalent. They're, they're, go they're never going to go anywhere. Let me tell you that. They're never going to go anywhere. It will be within you for life. But sometimes they remain very prevalent and very persistent throughout the years of your life and you don't even realize that that's what's going on. So ulcers are, 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 are and, and gastro inter, well, gastritis and all those kind of things, uh, those gastric issues, uh, many of them you're going to find are, are, are in regards to uh, life stressors. Um, and if you're in a high conflict uh, 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 relationship, right, you're going to have, you're going to be a good candidate for a lot of gastric issues. A lot of them. You're going to also find that you're going to be getting uh, uh, other uh, uh, conditions because once you begin to affect one area of your organs, other areas begin to be impacted. Like when you're really, uh, when you have a lot of anxiety and you're really stressed, your body is tense. Your body is tense, so you're tensing up all the time. There's certain muscles, you know, they're always tense. Right? You might start having back pain because you're, you're just always so tensed up. You may start having uh, chest pains as a result of the tightness in your chest and, you know, the, the palpitating heartbeat because you're so wound up. And then when you're in certain situations that are reminiscent of uh, the past 
uh, uh, events, right? And you're triggered now, you begin to experience and it intensifies as you go along. As long as you continue to, you know, don't bring any resolve to it, you're going to continue to feel that. You're going to continue to feel that. And it intensifies. Because if you, if this is your second, third, or fourth time experiencing this in, in, a same, in another relationship, then you haven't let go of the old one. So it's just like you're still in the old relationship. It's just like you're still in that old relationship. 5, 10, 15, 20 years later, that person is long gone out of your life and is just like it was then, right now, in a new relationship. So the, 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 the dagger goes deeper and deeper every time you have a failed relationship or even if it's, if it's perceived as heading towards failure, right? Whenever that, that situation arises again and you allow it to take control of you, in the course of that relationship, it grows, it festers, it becomes real. And that's why I was talking about the paranoia, it becomes real. You've made it fact in a good, healthy relationship, in a new, good, healthy relationship, you have allowed the 20 year ago relationship to bring, to, to be alive and well today. That's trauma, folks. That's trauma. So when we, when we talk about failing relationships, right, we need to really look at so many marriages are failing, so many relationships are failing because so many people are not doing the work on themselves. They want to keep working on their partner. Because if they, in, the, in their mind, if you get better with those things, I'll feel better about being with you. Because I need to feel better about being with you. And being with you and feeling better means that you have to change who you are to accommodate me because I'm not feeling better about myself. I'm not feeling better uh, about uh, who I am today and I'm, I want you to be the one to make me feel better. That's what it comes down to. I need for you to do this for me. And if you don't do this for me, then I don't want to be with you. I don't. The other physical impact of this profound sadness of a broken heart uh, has to do with headaches. Because if you always frowned up, now you can, I, you can see a scowl on my face now, but you can't see an internal scowl, right? The headaches that you continue to have over and over and over again because of the level of stress that you continue to put yourself under because you can't control things. See, when, when, when you start looking at trauma and you start looking at a person's personality and the need to control, right? Some people have the need to control everything around them in order for them to be happy. And if I can't control it, right? And, if, and especially if it regards another person, if I can't control that aspect of the other person, then I don't want to be with that other person. Because I need to be able to control that. I need to be able to control when happiness presents in this relationship. I need to be able to control when joy presents in this relationship. I need to be able to do whatever it is that I need for me to feel better in the moment. If I want to be in a, in a bad space, I want to be there and I want to bring you into it because I want you to feel that too. I don't want you to be joyful when I'm angry. I don't want you to be that. I want you to feel my anger. I want you to know that I'm angry. No, I didn't ask you could I talk about it with you. No, I don't want you. I, no, I just let me feel my anger. But let me also, uh, uh, let me also uh, uh, put my wrath upon you because I'm angry. I'm not angry with you. No, I'm not angry with you. It has nothing to do with you. I know it has nothing to do with me when I'm the recipient. 
But when I'm telling you that what you're doing though is upon me, then you, you're you saying no it's not. You're arguing with me that it's not. But it, it in fact has to do with the unresolved from your previous trauma. Nothing to do with me. So now we're at odds with one another because of your past. So I'm not at odds with your present. I'm at odds with your past. But you're telling me that your past has nothing to do with the present, therefore the future becomes bleak because we can't get past your past, which you keep putting in the present. But you don't see it from that perspective. That's trauma, right? So the headaches, right, that you continue to have is because of the, ele the ongoing, the persistent stress level. The persistent stress level. You just can't put thoughts together. Right? Every time you're thinking about one thing, you keep regressing and going back to the to the paranoia, the distrust of the other circumstance, and you let it just kind of sit there and it and it stays there and you just can't get it out of your mind because you, you allow it to stay there because you want something done about it. Because it's something has to be done about it. And surrender doesn't sound like what you want to do. You want to keep fighting it until the other person submits and they do something different. As opposed to you looking at, well, what is it about me that I keep harping on, I keep riding on this and I can't let it go, right? So even though the person has physically left, you still want to keep them within your, your spirit. And now you stop doing everything else. When was the last time you went to the masjid? When was the last time you went to church? When was the last time you went to, to study hall? When was the last time you did those things? When was the last time and you sat down and prayed? No, I'm not talking about the foxhole kind of prayer. I'm just talking about when have you sat down and made the connection? Right? Because I can tell you for me, when my spirit, you know, is, is, is uh, unbalanced, right? That I lose focus, right? Because I have to be on course. Right? Because that's who I am. I'm a, very, I'm, a very, I'm a very structured person. And when when I'm feeling imbalanced, my structure is thrown off. So the things that I do for myself, right, are out of balance. Right? So I'll miss my prayers. I'll stop making my prayers as, I, as I'm supposed to make. Oh, yeah, I can tell you that. I'm okay with that because that's between me and God. I care about somebody making a judgment about that. Self-righteousness is probably one of the biggest destructors of mankind. Because people wanted to tell people, well, you, oh man, you're going to, I didn't ask you about my relationship between me and God. It has nothing to do with you, so see yourself out of that. I'm okay with admitting that. Because I know that that's work that I do with me and God, and I know why I do that. Therefore, I know how to get back on track. I know what it's going to take. And sometimes it takes a while to get back on track. That's the human being. See? The human being takes care of itself. And when you're in alignment, right? God is always there, right? He's always there. And he knows very well what it is that you're going through when you go through those things. If you have a relationship with him. And I'm not, again, I, listen. I, that, that's, that's me. This is not a religious show, but it's my show. So agree or disagree, I can say what I want to because it's my show.